everyone, it's Alexandra, and this is part two of the video series called Mind Game. In part one, I discussed the light and its role in all religions and philosophies. This video builds on that one, so if you haven't seen that one yet, I recommend doing so before watching this one. In this video, we will be discussing who and what Lucifer is. Why? Well, while we're here in this world, we're in a battle. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save us from this world, from this mind game. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We have to talk about Lucifer in order to know how to resist, oppose, and stand against him. Before going into esoteric and occult topics, you need to be spiritually prepared. We are at war, and your best weapon is the truth. Your best defense is the word of God. What I do between working on videos is spending time building my relationship with God. I expect most of you to do the same so we can talk about difficult topics together, being well prepared and protected. All right, shall we get started? The personification of so-called enlightenment and knowledge comes from the light bringer himself, Lucifer, which literally means light bearer. The word Lucifer is derived from the Latin roots lux, meaning light, and fere to carry, meaning light bearer or light bringer, light carrier, one who brings light. Most know that Lucifer is a who, but in occultist circles, it's also a what. So what is Lucifer then? Well, Lucifer is not just a name, it's also a description. Charles W. Ledbetter refers to the senior deacon and brother men rituals as taking on the role of Lucifer. The senior deacon is the Lucifer who bears the light to his fellow men. Theoretically then, anyone can be a light bearer or a Lucifer. Helena Blavatsky's Lucifer magazine is a what? And I quote, designed to bring to light the hidden things of darkness, end quote. Or the instrument, the Lucifer Telescope, which allows astronomers to see through darkness. The acronym stands for the Large Binocular Telescope Near Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research. The name has since been changed to Lucy. Lucifer is part of the Large Binocular Telescope, which happens to be right next to the Vatican Observatory on Mount Graham in Safford. The Vatican has an observatory in Arizona manned by J astronomers. Now its next door neighbor is named for the devil. Alice Bailey, who was Helena Blavatsky's successor, writes in the preface of Lee Penn's book, False Dawn, quote, therefore the revolt of the angels against God was part of the divine plan of evolution. Bailey said that the great law of duality came into action, bringing about the fall of the angels as they descended from their sinless and free state of existence in order to develop full divine awareness upon earth through the medium of material incarnation and the use of the principle of mind. Bailey says that at the inception of the divine plan, there took place the original war in the heavens, when the sons of God who responded to the divine urge to experience, to serve, and to sacrifice separated themselves from the sons of God who responded to no such inspiration, but who chose to stay in their original and high state of being. The idea of the fallen angels being the, quote, good guys is the foundation of Luciferianism. A common misconception that was explosively popular in the 2010s via social media was the fear of an all-knowing, nefarious group called the Illuminati. While most dismissed this as saying Adam Whitehop's version of the Illuminati from Bavaria disbanded in the 1700s, many believed a small group of people controlling the world were called the Illuminati. While the Illuminati is as old as the knowledge handed down from Lucifer himself based on that definition of what Lucifer means, a centralized group or cult of people called the Illuminati is more fairy tale adjacent than reality. Anyone, anywhere, can be in the Illuminati since it isn't a place. It's a title. Illuminato, Illuminata, Illuminati. Raviolo, singular, ravioli, plural. Illuminato, Illuminati. An enlightened one. Someone who has hidden or secret knowledge. Someone who is enlightened. The Illuminati are the enlightened ones. Therefore, all Luciferian organizations have people who are Illuminati. Therefore, the Illuminati are everywhere. Anyone in the highest position in a profession that dictates the way the world works is a Lucifer. So that was the what. But who then is Lucifer? Lucifer, the fallen angel who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is in multiple versions of the canonical Bible as well as in extra-biblical texts. The term Lucifer 
is a Latin translation of the Hebrew description Hillel ben Shekar. Hillel is a root word that means to shine, to make a show, to boast, and thus to be clamorously foolish. Ben means sun, and Shekar means dawn. So, Hillel ben Shekar means shining one, son of the dawn. It doesn't really mean morning star, as some translations say. This descriptor is found in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. This verse is in the context of the fall of the king of Babylon. But there are some schools of thought that say that this is not just talking about a human king. It might be talking about the power behind the evil king or helping him. The king would probably not have said he was going to have a throne that was above gods because he most likely did not care about the Hebrew god. He was the king of Babylon after all. It could be talking past the king and to the powerful angel or angels that were influencing the king at the time. In Egypt, pharaohs were well-known channelers and seen as speaking for the gods. The same way I refer to those who rule this world, I'm not talking about the low-level humans or exoteric congregations or religious practitioners or the misinformation given by the media in television shows or movies about these elite. I'm talking about the powerful entities behind the top tier of these groups. In a lot of cases, if you know their names and see their faces, they're not very high up. Anonymity is prized above all else. Lucifer and the other fallen angels have been the evil, invisible power behind the world system he created using kings and rulers of Babylon, Tyre, Persia, Greece, Rome, and all of the other empires since, including America. Isaiah could be talking to the powerful angel that introduced sin into the world and caused the fall of man. Lucifer was given a high and exalted position until iniquity, injustice, and unrighteousness was found in him. According to Isaiah 14, 13 through 14, that iniquity was that he said in his heart that, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Notice the importance of the I wills. Lucifer was also given free will, but free will does not equal freedom from consequences. To bring it down to a completely human example, countries have laws. When they're violated, there is punishment. In a perfect world, the laws are in place for the good of the people. Now, the Quran says angels do not have free will at all, and were created from light to serve Allah. That's it. That's all they do. Quote, they do not disobey Allah in what he commands them, but do what they are commanded, says the Quran 66, 6. That is not true. Lucifer was not a jinn or other demon, as Islam tries to claim to explain their way out of not having rebel angels. Yet the presence of evil worldwide and the veneration of the fallen by every occult group proves otherwise. Matthew 24, 41 mentions the devil and his angels. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We can see this type of message again in Ezekiel 28, 14 through 15, where it seems like God is talking to the king of Tyre, but he might be talking not only to the king, but also past the king. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Lucifer decided he wanted to be the creator. That was the unrighteousness or iniquity that was found in him. He didn't want to serve God. He wanted to be God. Lucifer is an angel and was created to guard the very throne of God. What cherubim and seraphim do. There are different types of classes of angels in the Bible. The main ones are the seraphim, the cherubim, sometimes called cherubim, and the archangels. Isaiah describes seraphim in chapter 6, verses 2 through 3. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Cherubim are mentioned in Genesis 3.24 as guarding the tree of life with a flaming sword in the Garden of Eden after the fall. They were also depicted on the top of the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25.18-19. Ezekiel 1.4-14 details a vision of them. There are many similarities between the seraphim and the cherubim. Both are winged creatures, anthropomorphic, bright like fire and lightning or plasma, and both are near the throne of God and appear as guardians. So these two classes of heavenly beings are closely related, and the terms are often used interchangeably. Seraphim appear as fiery or radiant serpent-like creatures, and the word comes from a root meaning to burn. In the context of angelic beings, it is used synonymously in the Hebrew scriptures with the word nakash, denoting glorious, 
shining serpent, or dragon, from an assumed root meaning to be bright. This word also describes Satan in the Garden of Eden. The word seems to be used interchangeably for seraphs or serpents, which make the study a bit more difficult as to what form Lucifer appeared to Eve in in the garden itself. This is Genesis 3 through 1 in Strong's Concordance, and in verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The word serpent in Strong's is 5175, Nakash. And the etymology says the word is from 5172, a snake, from its hiss or a serpent. Since the word was originally from Strong's 5172, let's see what that definition of the snake is. The origin says a primitive root properly to hiss or to whisper a magic spell, generally to prognosticate, which means to foretell or prophesy. Certainly, divine enchanter, an enchantment to learn by experience, indeed diligently observe. The Greek Strong's says to practice divination, divine, observe signs, learn by experience, diligently observe, practice fortune telling, take as an omen, that's a Hebrew grammar verb stem that means to shatter, to practice divination, to observe the signs or omens. If we check the other times the word serpent is used in 3.2, and in 3.4, and in 3.14, the definition is the same. This word can refer to someone who learns the ways of the occult, someone who wishes to be enlightened through Gnosis. Jesus used the same word for the Pharisees in Matthew 23.33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? If I click on 3789, it gives me the Greek Strong's definition probably from 3,700 through the idea of sharpness of vision, a snake figuratively as a type of sly cunning, an artful malicious person, especially Satan, serpent. The Hebrew strong says a snake, a serpent. With the ancients, the serpent was a symbol of cunning and wisdom. The serpent who deceived Eve was regarded by the Jays as the devil. And here's a familiar number, 5175. That's the same definition as we just got for the serpent in Genesis. And there's the practitioner of the occult again. Since Jesus was not talking to literal snakes, he was actually calling out the Pharisees for their occult practices. They were the Luciferians of their day following what Lucifer had taught Adam and Eve. Please look into that if you're not familiar. What's interesting to me about all of this is that the action of Lucifer performed in the garden was indeed whispering a magic spell to teach secret knowledge so that Adam and Eve might attain godhood or become visionaries, having raised the kundalini to become enlightened ones. Raising the kundalini is akin to being born again in Luciferianism, but being born again to Lucifer, not Jesus. The use of serpents being connected to enlightenment, knowledge, and the mysteries is a worldwide phenomenon. A long time ago, there was a, a Navajo medicine man who had gone to the Kingman mine, and uh, to the Navajo people, they say that the snakes are in part of their uh, ceremonial uh, uh, dances, ceremonies, and so what the Navajo uh, medicine men had thought of was that the, the green, the, the brown green swirls that you see there look like snakes dancing you know, in, inside the turquoise, and so they called that the ceremonial turquoise. Also, the worldwide depiction of snakes as the bringer of fire, light, and knowledge gives credence to Lucifer's either serpentine appearance or characteristics. Remember that Lucifer does not work alone. Hundreds of watchers fell, and he most likely has many angels and other living creatures working alongside him to deceive humanity. The Eastern occultism of the Kundalini is the same as the Western Kabbalah. While they are different spiritual systems exoterically, they share the same symbols and esoterically are no different. So is the same idea of the Kundalini, the serpent, being at the base of the spine and going up to dot gnosis, partaking in the pineal gland the imagery depicted on the plume serpent mound. Brazilian occultism called Umbanda also corresponds to Kabbalah. In Druidism, the life force or energy force is considered to be the dragon, sometimes called a winged lion. They all explain the same idea, the same symbolism, just different language. If you remember from the first video in this mind game series, Kabbalah is not a religion, it's a philosophy and many different belief systems practice it. Ultimately, it's a practice of worshiping the light. A book called The Serpent Myths of Ancient Egypt, written by William Ricketts Cooper in 1873 and archived online by Cornell University, discusses the Urias, 
or the rearing cobra that was a sign of royalty in ancient Egypt. The serpent as Urias is simply the phonetic of the letter G. This may be another reason the G figures so prominently in Brother Man iconography. The conclusion I've come to is this. It doesn't matter really what type of angel Lucifer is, but the fact that he is an angel who came to earth and taught men all kinds of worthless and wicked things along with other angels who did the same. We can see proof of this in our history and every day in symbolism and artwork and idolatry. Okay, so we've talked a little about serpent symbolism and how it refers to wisdom, probably associated with the seraphim. But what symbolism is associated with cherubim? The occult uses lions, oxes, and eagles in their symbolism often, possibly in a way to honor the fallen. We can find proof of this with the tetramorph, a four-faced creature rooted in the Sumerian zodiac. Another example of ancient cultures worshipping the angels who fell taught humans all kinds of things, and in turn, the humans ended up worshipping them. God created holy angels. Some became fallen angels once they turned their back on God. But God made the way that they look, so animals are not evil in themselves. It's the symbolism put onto them that makes them represent evil things in the occult, like the ox. An ox is just an ox, but to the occult, it refers to Moloch and Baal, or child sacrifice. According to Myths of Babylonia and Assyria by Donald A. McKenzie in 1915, quote, the animals associated with the god Asher were the bull, the eagle, and the lion. He either absorbed the attributes of other gods or symbolized the self-power of which the animals were manifestations. You'll remember that Asher correlates to Marduk, Baal, Osiris, and Osiris is also Nimrod. Depictions of these creatures can be seen on the Ishtar Gate, the eighth gate of the city of Babylon. The term cherubim is of uncertain origin. It could be related to the Greek word gripos, meaning curved or hooked which is also the exact definition of a griffin, or a winged creature, and the phonetically similar cherub. The definition of a griffin is a fabulous beast with the head and wings of an eagle and the body of a lion. Or the word could have been from the Akkadian caribou, a related Hebrew word is cherub. Ezekiel 1, 4-28 describes what cherubim looked like. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continuously, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of it all came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. The griffin has the face of an eagle, the body of a lion, the tail of a dragon, wings of a bat, and the feet of an eagle. The word griffin, or the winged dragon, comes from the word wyron, that is derived from Middle English wyver, from Old North French viver or viper. Griffins and dragons figure heavily in the art and mythologies of countless cultures. For example, the red dragon on the flag of Wales, or China, and the biggest empire most have never heard of, Tartaria. Tartaria was a massive landmass and empire with different types of cultures in it and very distinct architecture. I have an odd story to add. So, a repairman came to my house and he looked different from any ethnicity that I had seen before. The whole time he was working, I was trying to put my finger on like, where in Asia he must have been from. Eventually I just asked him and he said, my people have no country anymore. I'm Hmong. Now, Mong and Mongol are two totally different ethnic groups with different uh, cultures and customs and differences like that. But he said that the elders have told them that the Mong are related to the Native American Indians. So, me being me, I just decided to ask, were your people from Tartaria? And he goes, how do you know that? He agreed and explained that Tartaria was their country long ago and... Now they have no homeland. About 40 years ago, the US government brought over many Hmong who had emigrated to Vietnam and Laos. Brotherman Albert Pike mentioned in Morals and Dogma that Tartaria used to be near China. A mockery of Tartarian architecture can be found in Kazakhstan, once called Khazaristan, in its capital of Astana, which is an anagram for Satana, that has now been renamed Complete with Brother Manic Pillars, Yashin, and Boaz, the presidential palace, Accorda, is meant to look like the architecture of Tartaria. This is the same style as the Vatican and the Capitol building. Back to the four faces of the cherubim used in the occult. 
The ox face of the cherubim is represented in Moloch, Baal, or Pan. The eagle figures into Luciferian symbolism as well. And if you fall as Lucifer fell. Notice the placement of the eagle, a common occult symbol for Lucifer. And it's also the national bird of America. In the U.S., the Freedom Statue was placed on top of the Capitol Dome in 1866. A 19-and-a-half-foot-tall statue of a god or goddess morphing into an eagle, or having the head of an eagle. The Statue of Freedom faces east, toward the sun, and the sculptor was a brother man. As I said in my other videos, Lucifer has influenced many powerful men throughout history. Judas was one example. And he is still using countless humans to do his bidding. And sometimes, a griffin is shown with a human face. Lucifer is referred to as a lion in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The lion is used in brotherman initiations. That doesn't mean that the ox, the lion, and the eagle are bad. All cherubim look that way because God made them perfectly. It, it's just interesting that the occult often uses those animal archetypes and they're used to represent their gods, as if every culture shares the same story of these characters coming to Earth being worshipped. The symbol of Saturn was around before the exodus of the Jays from Egypt. It was a six-pointed star. Notice the four faces, men, eagle, lion, and ox. This star is not the Star of David. In fact, Acts 7.43 says, Yea, he took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which he made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. This star replaced the menorah as the symbol of Israel when the Rothschilds created present-day Israel in 1948. Please note that most people inside Israel are not on an esoteric basis, so very few are zeists. Just like most people in America have no idea what their leaders actually believe. I don't ever want to promote racism. Alright, so we've talked about what Lucifer is and the type of angel he may be, but what is his name? Lucifer's name can be found in the first emphasis on first book of Enoch, translated by R.H. Charles. The first Book of Enoch is biblically endorsed as canon in various scriptures, yes, many more than just the book of Jude. For example, Enoch 9, 8-9 describes how the Watchers, or the fallen angels, married women and fathered the Nephilim. You can pause the video if you want to read the slides here. The same information is given in Genesis 6, 1-4. The canonical Bible confirms Enoch's description of the fallen angels fathering children who were giants. I'm not trying to make anyone read Enoch who doesn't want to read Enoch, but I think it's a good resource that's worth investigating. A word of caution here, there are two other books of Enoch, the second or the Slavic version and the third book of Enoch. Neither one of those have anything to do with the original, the first book of Enoch, or the Ethiopian version. The Jayish Sohar, which is a compilation of esoteric teachings, uses the second book of Enoch, which is called Echelo Rabati. It includes magical rituals and incantations to summon angels and to ascend and descend from heaven, attempting to become an angel. Some practitioners of the Zohar, including the rabbi credited with writing it, have died in this process. The third book of Enoch is also in the Zohar, and is called the Sefer Echelo. The name Metatron is used in these writings to represent Enoch. You may have inadvertently been exposed to these teachings of the Zohar if you've heard the name Metatron used to refer to Enoch. The second and third book of Enoch are mystical Jayish teachings and have nothing to do with the first book of Enoch. No, Enoch is not in the modern canonical Bible any longer. So, who determined which books of the Bible were divinely inspired? With research and study, you can find the groups of men who decided over centuries which books would be included and which would not. The first was a group of 120 rabbis called the Great Men of Assembly later called the Sanhedrin, who lived between the first and second temple eras in Israel. The Sanhedrin was essentially the Jewish Supreme Court and was primarily made up of Pharisees. They decided which books would be included in the Old Testament, and then later, the Catholic Church, after a series of councils, Nicaea, Laodicea, Hippo, Carthage, and Trent, decided on the rest of the books. This was a sin of omission, by taking entire books out you can't throw out the validity of scripture based on occultists leaving things out and translating different versions. The original manuscripts still exist and can be read and compared. God's word can still easily be proven despite the attempts to confuse.
The information given by Enoch disproves the Luciferians' version of history, the Stone Age, the Ice Age, cave people, dinosaurs, scientism, evolution, sci-fi cosmology, and heliocentrism, the most literal form of worshipping the light. Even modern scientism as we know it is a religion. Those who played a major role in spreading scientism values across the world were brothers, occultists, alchemists, Rosicrucians, Kabbalists, and philosophers. In other words, Luciferians. 1 Timothy 6, 19-21 says, Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. The King James said, Science falsely so called, instead of knowledge. Strong's Concordance translates the word as gnosis. Merriam-Webster defines gnosis as esoteric knowledge of spiritual truth held by the ancient Gnostics to be essential to salvation. Google translates it as the knowledge of spiritual mysteries. What Paul was saying in 1 Timothy is that part of fighting the good fight of faith is to avoid the babble and contradictions of gnosis, like what secret societies, occult groups, and Kabbalah and other philosophies teach. The disciples face the same enemy we do the same vipers who whisper secret knowledge. Nothing has changed. The mysteries have continued to this day. Sure, maybe they've been rebranded and repackaged, but they're still the same tired old lies. Just one micro example is that of the Royal Society in England, which was arguably the birthplace of modern science. From there, discoveries like those of Sir Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin were supported. It was the Brothermen who made the Royal Society a reality. Sir Robert Morey was a Brotherman and one of the founders and the first president of the Royal Society of London. Newton, of course, was famous for his obsession with alchemy, which was coined by Hermes Trismegistus, who was called the father of alchemy, which involves transmutation of elements and transcendence of consciousness. One of the goals of alchemy was the transmutation of lead to gold, dark to light, dark to light, dark to light. The scientific revolution led to the Enlightenment, which was influenced by the idea of the power of human beings being able to discern truth through reasoning and rationalism. What this really did was branch out their control beyond the walls of religious buildings and into every facet of modern society. Some people believe that religion is just what happened before science was invented. But just keep in mind that every piece of science on your dinner table was lovingly crafted by druids, zeists, jayists, brothers, occultists, or luciferians. So, by eating that meal, you are what you eat, and you too espouse their religious views, knowingly or not. Also, just because a religion might predate what is called Christianity, that does not mean that it predates God or Jesus. Nothing predates the Creator. Pre-Christianity is not pre-God. But this is not a video on the occult roots of modern science, so let's move on. Anyway, my point is, research some of the foundational characters modern science is based on and it will reveal that they are Luciferians, who believe mystical doctrines in modern science is not separate from, but has formed its own sort of religion. Beliefs, sacred texts, leaders in the field, the list goes on. I talked more about this in my older video, Are You Believing a Lie? Many scientific inventions in the field of transportation, power, and medicine would greatly improve the lives of everyone on Earth. But scientists not in the club, so to speak, have been silenced, forgotten, murdered, or had their patents stolen. There is no question to the scientific field being extremely compromised by Luciferian agendas. As a former atheist, I can now see how the most exoteric forms of Luciferianism can be found in Scientism, which is the replacement for God aimed at atheists. This is due to the way that so-called enlightened men view those lacking faith in a supreme being. Secret societies keep secrets from their initiates, reserved for their elect, and instead give false information, explanations, or definitions of symbols and themes to anyone they believe deserves to be misled. 32nd degree brother Joshua L. Rubin writes how atheists cannot join the Lodge. There is a universal brothermanic requirement of belief in deity, which is followed by all irregular Grand Lodges in the world. Or whatever one feels like calling the great architect behind it all. 
As entered apprentices receiving light for the first time, brothers are cautioned that no atheists may be made a brother. Therefore, as soon as we become entered apprentices, we are warned not to submit known atheists for candidacy for the degrees. The first conclusion is that atheists are incapable of following God's moral law, and they are therefore incapable of meeting on the square. The most often quoted example comes from James Anderson and his Constitutions of Brothermen. A brother is obliged by his tenure to obey the moral law, and if he rightly understands the art, he will never be a stupid atheist, nor an irregular libertine. So in brothermanic literature, they think atheists are too stupid and immoral to be accepted into their ranks and learn their secret knowledge. Again, yet another contrast to the creator god, who gives everyone an equal opportunity at the gift of forsaking this world, Lucifer's kingdom, for his eternal kingdom. An important reason that Jesus came down in the flesh was to show that there is only one way to God, and that is through him. No need for gatekeepers of knowledge, and that any worship of idols fashioned after the fallen leads to nothing but death. Further down in the article, the author admits Brother Manry is religious in nature. Quote, was Brother Manry only a society of fraternity with no religious component, such as a moose club or a charity-only organization, such as Rotary International, these stringent requirements regarding an individual's belief would not be as important. Our fraternity, however, is one with religious components. Right, before that tangent, we were talking about the Book of Enoch, the translation by R.H. Charles. One reason we're aware of it at all is because fragments of it were found between 1946 and 1956 in Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls, written in ancient Aramaic. Remember also that the entire first book of Enoch has always been in the Ethiopic Bible. The first book of Enoch is just one of the many books the men of the Great Assembly left out of the scriptures. It was left out of the Old Testament by the Sanhedrin because, in my opinion, it exposes their false narrative about the world. Enoch describes God, Jesus, the angels, heaven, a flat and stationary earth, biblical cosmology, the flood, and the second coming prophecies. Enoch refers to Jesus as the elect one with God. Jesus as God who was made flesh and dwelt among us, died and rose again. He was there before creation. John 1 shows that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Anyway, if you haven't read the first book of Enoch, I have left a link in the description below. Enoch enables us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It gives us a more complete version of history than the Luciferian history book makers want us to have and allows us to identify our enemies more specifically. It tells us who the fallen angels that came down were, gives their names, as well as lists all of the worthless things that they taught to humanity, like war and violence. In chapter 69, Enoch describes the five chief Satans or adversaries that fell. In verse 6 through 7, it tells us what Lucifer's name is. And the third was named Gadrael. He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death, and he led astray Eve, and showed the weapons of death to the sons of men, the shield and the coat of mail, the sword for battle, and all the weapons of death to the children of men. And from his hand they have proceeded against those who dwell on the earth from that day and forevermore. Gadrael is a war angel, a master of the art of war and of complex war strategies, both psychological and physical. While a teaching at the temple, Jesus confirms the traits of Gadrael, Lucifer, when condemning the Pharisees. John 8, 45 says, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Jesus uses the same traits as Enoch to describe Gadrael, a murderer from the beginning, and a liar. Gadrael and the fallen angels are the ones who gave the people knowledge, and it is from their esoteric teachings that things like the Kabbalah, Hinduism, and consequently all of the world's religions began. It appears Lucifer's name is Gadrael. The suffix of the name Gadrael, E-L-L, -L, means of God. It means wall of God, to wall off, to build a wall, builder of God, or even more interestingly, mason of God. This shows his character as an architect or a builder in nature. Is it any wonder then that at the highest esoteric level, this entity has the most honorable position in his own craft? The God of the world he built? I know that was a lot of info, but if you're still with me, I want to show you this image of a brother manic tracing board they use to teach symbolism in different degrees. The shield depicts four figures, 
an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a man. The faces associated with the cherubim. Above this figure is the shining chi, higher than the shield. Again, another example of an occult depiction of Gadriel and his army. I know I talk about them in every video, but I can't overstate how important this entire institution of the society has been to parade the mysteries across the entire plane. The New Age, a catch-all term for any Luciferian, Gnostic, or ancient mysteries, is the daughter of Brother Manry, and esoteric Brother Manry is the workhorse of the world governments. To those who understand the significance of Saint Germain, and not only the Ascended Master version in the New Age, but also the characters throughout history and current events today, it is interesting to note that Charles Ledbetter, speaking on the preservation of symbols and rituals, says, The business was always in the hands of the Shohan of the Seventh Ray, for that is the ray most especially connected with ceremonial of all kinds. And its head was always the supreme hierophant of the mysteries of ancient Egypt. The present holder of that office is that master of the wisdom of whom we often speak as the Count de Saint Germain, because he appeared under that title in the 18th century. He is also sometimes called Prince Ricosi, and he is the last survivor of that royal house. Exactly when he was appointed to the headship of the ceremonial ray, I do not know, but he took a keen interest in Brother Manry as early as the 3rd century AD. I explained how St. Germain figures into the big picture at the end of An Inconvenient History, starting at an hour and a half in. Ledbetter goes on to explain some of the many characters St. Germain has influenced throughout history, and then he says, quote, In co-brother Manry, we refer to him as the head of all true brothers throughout the world, abbreviated as the H-O-A-T-F. And in some of our lodges, his portrait is placed in the east, above the chair of the right worshipful master and just beneath the star of initiation. Others place it in the north, above an empty chair. Upon his recognition and ascent as head of the seventh ray, the validity of all rites and degrees depends. Please notice that Ledbetter capitalizes him and his. This small detail is called reverential capitalization, which is the practice of capitalizing religious words that refer to a deity or divine being. Ledbetter inadvertently confirmed that Saint Germain, a character with the attributes of Lucifer, is the god of Brother Manry and by extension, Theosophy. The New Age, being the daughter of Brother Manry, also claims Saint Germain is the Shohan of the Seventh Ray. Now, I don't believe in New Age philosophies or characterizations, but in order to see the big picture, it's important to understand their beliefs because very powerful people believe in this. Like all legends, there are different versions, but the outline is basically the same. As I've mentioned before, the story of Saint Germain is an old one, and has been retold and passed down by Brother Manry, the New Age, the Order of the Golden Dawn, the Rosicrucians, the Knights of Columbus, and many more for centuries. His attributes, actions, and importance throughout history suggest he is behind many influential occultists and New Age channelers guiding humanity to his end goal or promoting his plan for humanity. That is, the Light World Order goal. Saint Germain is considered to be the founder of the Rosicrucian, Brother Men, and the Knights of Columbus movements. Shrouded in their own self-imposed mysteries today, the Rosicrucians, Brothers, and Knights of Columbus all admit to a chief role played by Saint Germain in their rites and ceremonies. If he is considered to be the founder of these Luciferian organizations, he would figure as one of the grandest Luciferians of all time. I'm really happy for you, I'm gonna let you finish, but Saint Germain was one of the grandest Luciferians of all time. Organizations that follow the light, hold this character or his, quote, energy, unquote, in high regard, especially those on the light side. There are two paths in all societies, the dark or the light, with an overwhelming majority on the dark path. Few influential figures were on the light side. We'll discuss this topic in the final video of the series. The New Age claims Saint Germain is many things. He is an entity, a spirit, has influenced many people throughout history, and sometimes recognized as the greatest Lucifer. The angel as well as the embodiment of enlightenment. He is their who and what. The Triangle Book is attributed to Saint Germain and is a triangular grimoire. The book itself is triangular in shape, on vellum, and written in cipher with the exception of the title page. The cipher itself is quite simple, belonging to the class found in Brother Manic documents and decodes into French. 
It is titled The Sacred Magic Revealed to Moses, recovered in an Egyptian monument and carefully preserved in Asia under the device of a winged dragon, written about 1750. On the first page, above a wyvern, or a griffin, are the words, quote, by the gift of the most wise Count de Saint Germain, who passed through the circle of the earth. Unquote. The writing itself belongs to a class known as grimoire or manuals of ceremonial magic. Saint Germain had a secret treasure with clues hidden in the triangle book with the dragon emblem. He came from the dragon lineage. He was a dragon magus from an ancient Scythian family, which legend says founded both Sumeria and Egypt after the Black Sea flood led to migration. The dragon is also a symbol of immortality. In alchemy, of which Saint Germain was well versed, a dragon usually guards treasure, like gold and precious stones. The Triangle Book is now housed in the Getty Library in Los Angeles after it was bought from Manly P. Hall, as you can see here. Saint Germain left Brother Man Code instructions in the Triangle Book on how to find things in the sea that were lost after the flood, how to find diamond and gold mines, and how to preserve one's health and prolong one's life for a century, as if they were still 50. Saint Germain is revered by brother men and the New Age alike. He has been equated with many significant occultists throughout history. For example, alchemist and founder of Hermeticism, Hermes Trismegistus. Others include Plato, Christopher Columbus, and Francis Bacon. It's claimed that Saint Germain is closely tied to King Solomon. A letter written in the late 1700s by occultist and alchemist Count Cagliostro claims that Saint Germain said himself he was, quote, many centuries old and had been at King Solomon's court when the Queen of Sheba paid her famous state visit there. That's a very specific occasion Saint Germain claims he witnessed. First Kings chapter 10 documents the visit, and in verse 14 it says, quote, Now the weight in gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. The very next chapter discusses Solomon's apostasy. If Saint Germain was indeed part of the event with Solomon and Queen Sheba, it would make sense why the brothers and other occultist societies had a mission to, quote, rebuild Solomon's temple, being in the hearts of not only their own members, but in humanities. The esoteric degrees understand that the temple is inside of you, which is why there is such an importance placed on psychological warfare. Remember, this war is as much spiritual and psychological as it is physical. Those who have ordered at the Eastern Bar, sorry for the censorship, the sister segment of Brother Manry, at least five times or received the five degrees of the Bar are eligible to join the segment dedicated to Sheba as the Queen of the South. Francis Bacon's book, The New Atlantis, a work unfinished, from 1627, is sometimes credited to Saint Germain, and predicted a place where freedom and peace could reign under brother manic order without a monarchy. It would be the place where the heritage of the House of Solomon could prosper until a golden age culture of science and logic. In The Secret Symbols of the Dollar Bill, David Ovison raises the possibility that the earliest official use of the five-pointed star in North America may have been at the request of none other than Francis Bacon. In 1727, Saint Germain developed and shared secret money-making techniques with European royalty and bankers. Instead of sharing the wealth with humanity, the bankers squandered it for themselves, so in 1729, Saint Germain created the World Trust. The World Trust is said to be the source of funding for the prosperity funds the light Luciferians say humanity will receive after the death of the old system. So many New Agers are now eagerly awaiting Nasara and Chisara, a system set up by Saint Germain, pushing Jesus out of the way as the savior. Within the New Age and Theosophy, Saint Germain takes on the role of a teacher of the Aquarian Age, and his Latin name, Sanctus Germanus, means Holy Brother. He claims to be the brother of Jesus, the teacher of the Piscean Age. In the New Age, Saint Germain stands beside Jesus, his equal. Jesus is God. God has no equal. This shows the audacity and illogical nature of Luciferianism, desperately attempting to absorb the truth of Jesus and spit it out as watered-down, inclusive, powerless beliefs. An effort was made in the late 1700s to eliminate Saint Germain's name from modern Brothermanic literature when the Brothermen were taken over by a darker faction. It appears from writings that the leadership took a decided turn from Saint Germain's original ideas to a more sinister, dark agenda, also known as the Dark World Order. At the low levels of Brother Manry, the initiates are given exoteric information. They're told things like the G in Brother Manry stands for God or geometry. 
As the initiate progresses through the ranks, they are given more esoteric knowledge, if they are deemed worthy to know it by the higher-ranking members. Brothermen, like most other organizations with a hierarchical structure, are usually left on an exoteric basis, never knowing the true core, history, or agenda of the religion or organization they're a part of. No one believes a lie. They believe what to them looks like the truth. So back to Godrael. Why does it matter what his name is? It doesn't really, just to show his nature as a mason or a builder. What matters are his characteristics so you can identify him. That's what this is all about. Know your enemy, so you can stand against your enemy and not be fooled any longer. Godrael is the angel that led Eve astray and threw the world into chaos, the fall, or where things all began to age and die. This is not the intended world created for humans. This is why we must endure and carry on the best we can while keeping the commandments of God and faith in his son, Jesus Christ. God did not want us to be ignorant. Rather, Adam and Eve already had access to every bit of knowledge imaginable because God walked with them in the Garden of Eden. They could have asked him anything. Godrael told Eve that she would not die and that she would be like a god. Spoiler alert, she died. The irony is that she and Adam were already immortal. The oldest lie in the book, ye shall be as gods, is still being bought and sold today. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That seems to be a translation of what actually means knowledge from good to evil, or the knowledge of everything. In literature, this is called a merism, and is a figure of speech used to include everything between two words. When you put the Hebrew phrase tavwara into Google Translate, it says right and wrong. Enoch only calls the tree the tree of knowledge. I also find it interesting that God tells Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit. But Eve lies when she repeats God's words because she adds, neither shall you touch it. If this knowledge is everything from right to wrong, God doesn't say not to be knowledgeable about it, to look at it, to understand it. What is forbidden is to eat it, to consume it, or incorporate it, to become it, to believe it, and to let it become you. When Godrael rebelled and betrayed God, all that was good in him was replaced by darkness and violence. His pride blinded him. You see, evil is not the opposite of good. It is the absence of it. Good is not the opposite of evil. Goodness is polar to rebellion. A child who disobeys their parent or their guardian is not evil, they're rebellious. By Lucifer saying that anyone can become a god by eating of the fruit of the tree, it takes away the majesty and the power that God has, since, theoretically, anyone can do it. Knowledge is neither good nor bad, but it can be used both ways. Adam and Eve surpassed wanting basic knowledge of their world, which could have easily been granted by simply asking. Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me and I will answer you, and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Instead, Adam and Eve chose to follow the path to become gods themselves. This is extremely different from wanting to just gain knowledge or wisdom. Knowledge for its sake alone is self-aggrandizement. Too much of anything is detrimental to human health. The small therapeutic margin of knowledge is no different. Herbs can be helpful to heal us from common ailments, but too much or the wrong combinations can cause all sorts of things, even abortion. Like that popular meme, how much salami can a cat have? A cat can have a little salami, but too much will cause harm and malnutrition leading to untimely death. Secret knowledge may seem powerful and exhilarating in the moment, but once the novelty wears off, you'll discover that it's nearly impossible to arrive at any actual applicable truth, as opposed to the living God's truth, which never changes and causes everything else to fall away. That's the thing. The truth is evident to itself. It will always reveal itself. You don't have to worry about questioning the truth. It can stand up to anything. It's true. A point I really want to drive home today is that there is no overall truth in the mysteries. Every system views the same symbol differently at different levels of initiation. What means something to one group means something completely different to another. It's all subjective. The interpreter is the one who decides the truth. With, with God, his truth never changes. It's up to the interpreter to understand this never changing truth. There isn't only one enemy, there is Godrael, but there is also an entire plethora and hierarchy of angels and a complex system of leaders and chiefs and armies and demons. It's not logical then to say that one entity is responsible for all of the pain, confusion, and suffering in this world. 
There are many. We are in a battle with many types of powers in the Fallen Army, and we are also fighting against all sorts of wickedness, both human rulers who share blood with the Fallen, as well as other spiritual entities who give them their power. The Nephilim were the children of humans and angels. They grew into giants, they were the reason for the Flood, since they were destroying and killing not only humanity, but all living creatures. God didn't flood the earth because humankind was just too horrible, like the Anunnaki account alleges. God had to destroy the gigantic human-angel-animal hybrid monsters that were fathered by the fallen angels, then continued interbreeding, as well as the mystery teachings of the fallen that had caused so much violence, hatred, and sheer confusion on earth. Now, the spirits of the Nephilim killed in the flood live among us, causing havoc and leading humans towards evil. Unlike in the days of Noah when you had a slim chance of getting away from a giant and being killed, we do have the ability not to follow these spirits, but instead to fight them. If your height was equal to your wealth, how tall would you be? Giants never left. They are financial or power giants now. The ruling class is still the wealthy. Everyone was born into this mind game and has been under Lucifer's spell, whether they know it or not. That's a fundamental difference between God and Lucifer. God values free will so much that he gives you the opportunity to reject him. Otherwise, we would just be mindless slaves. Exactly what Lucifer has worked so tirelessly to create. That's why I said earlier that the truth is an opt-in system and Lucifer's are opt-out. For the victims born into satanic ritual abuse, they endure endless trauma in an attempt to completely destroy their ability to consciously reject Lucifer by making them believe that they have no free will at all. The only way out of this world is through repentance of sin, trusting in Jesus as your savior, and seeking the truth with discernment from the Holy Spirit. While we're stuck here, to have God's protection is the best form of protection from these evil spirits, evil institutions, and all kinds of deception. We also have the free will to ask for God to save us from the world and protect us. In the next and final video in the Mind Game series, we will be discussing one of the biggest deceptions believed by the, we will call them Illuminati, or the Enlightened Ones, or the Luciferians. Something called the Force. Thank you for watching this video. I will see you all next time. Bye!